My name is Renee Hopper, and I am an MTSS um, specialist, um, along with my friend Alicia Young. Um, and we are on the same team as uh, Gina and Lisa that you saw earlier. Chrissy and Sarah are busy with high school, and we're going to get to work with you all year long um, through different trainings. And um, we're very excited about that. And, um, and both of us have um, different backgrounds. My background is more elementary. I've taught first grade, third grade, fourth grade, outdoor ed science camp, and PE. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and so I tend to work more with the elementary teachers. And Alicia? Hello, I'm Alicia Young. Welcome everyone. It's such an exciting day and love all your energy and excitement and ready to get back to school. Um, I have worked in the district for a long time and um, have spent time in elementary and many years in middle school as well. So we welcome you all and we are going to have some great uh, activities planned for you this afternoon, give you some information um, about one of those number one things that we worry about, which is managing behaviors in the classroom. And we're going to be talking about that um, and hopefully give you some ideas, solidify some things so that you walk into the classroom and you're feeling strong and ready to go. One of our rules as presenters and um, in doing this work is that um, we model best practices, which means this is not going to be a lecture session. So you will need a partner. So um, you're going to make sure that you're sitting near someone that you can have conversations with because we know that when we process information, it sticks with us better and it's um, something we can take back with us. So I encourage you right now to find a partner. If you're at a table all by yourself, there's plenty of spaces at the big tables. And second is we have handouts um, at the end of tables. So those need to be passed down. They're at both ends of the table. Make sure you get a packet that looks like this. So go ahead, quickly find yourself a partner, and I'm going to check in with you in 30 seconds. So let's practice this, because it's really important that when I put my hand up, you put your hand up, because some of you are going to have your backs to me a little bit, and that way they can see that signal. So. Um, We'll practice that throughout the morning. Um, it's a great attention signal, um, and we will use it throughout the year with all of the trainings that you go to. We're going to talk about classroom management. And the reason we're talking about this is it is vital to our, um, to our classrooms. Without good classroom management, we cannot instruct our students. Correct? And it is something that has to be set at the very beginning of, of the school year. And in our district, we've worked with safe and civil schools and have implemented um, some of the work from Randy Sprick. And so today, we're gonna help you get that foundation set. Some of you, if you went to WSU, have already probably had some work with this. Um, others of you, it might be new, or maybe you did this in your old school district. But that's what we're gonna be talking about today, is all things classroom management. Your first activity, I want you to do some thinking. I want you to think about, you know, who was my favorite teacher? Who was an educator that impacted me? It could be someone from elementary, middle, or high. And I want you just to think for a minute about that, write their name, what they taught, and why did that teacher or educator make an impact on you? What was it? So go ahead and voice level zero, just take about a minute to jot that down. Put that aside. We're going to come back to that later. Um, so just kind of put that aside for now. You know, this morning uh, we had champs earlier. We have champs now too. Just a quick review. That, um, uh, voice level zero, why the facilitator is speaking. A one when you're speaking to your partner. Um, and a two if you're speaking out to the group. Um, if you need help, please flag down myself, Alicia, um, or uh, Gina, or Lisa, and we'd be happy to help you with any concerns or questions. And our activity is a proactive approach to classroom management. And that word proactive is really the key. It's preventative. That's what we're after, is the preventative piece. Preventing that behavior before it starts. M, movement. Participate in all the structures, but take care of your own needs if you need to get up. P, Participations, we won't need electronics today, so if you want to make sure those are on vibrate and set those aside. 
and take notes. You have your two part, your partner, and then um, you know our attention signal. And success is success for all USD 259 students in academics and behavior, and also success for you as an educator. All right, this morning you talked about lesson planning and one of those pieces with the content and literacy objectives. So we're going to share with you what we want to go over, you know, specifically um, during this session, which we are going to begin with our content objectives. And you can see the words that are kind of in green and underlined. So Coral Reed, jump in with me and read out loud the underlined green words. All right, so the content objectives are we will learn about the variables of stoic. And we will understand the importance of classroom rules, as well as we will become familiar with CHAMPS and ACHIEVE. And ACHIEVE is something, an acronym that we use in our high schools, and then you become, you're becoming more familiar with CHAMPS, as Renee just went over those, and we're gonna talk about that today. And our literacy objective, so this is how, I had somebody ask me, specifically the difference between the content and literacy. So the literacy objective is how we're going to be doing this work. So we will begin um, writing a classroom management and discipline plan, and we will write rules and expectations using Champs and Achieve. And then some of you will go a little bit more in depth with us um, tomorrow with that as well. There are two pieces of paper I'd like you to locate. Within the district, we have six key requirements. These are non-negotiable requirements. Um, and we have protocols. So we have a literacy protocol, there's a numeracy protocol, there's an instructional protocol that you received this morning, and a behavior protocol, which is in front of you now. And it streamlined the resources that we have within our district, and it ensures that all students, no matter what building they're in, have access to high-quality research-based curriculum and programs. Okay? The front of it, what I want you to focus on is the core, the side that says core. The reason why we want to focus on core is because this is where the preventative pieces come. This is our tier one. This is all kids in our whole classroom. Um, and we're going to structure everything in our classroom for success. Um, and you've done some work with this already, some of you from your past teaching experiences, others of you from student teaching. Um, but today we're going to take time to also go over the components of STOIC. And if you look on your behavior protocol, you can see um, STOIC stands for structure, teach expectations, observe, interact positively, and correct calmly and fluently. Under each of these are some um, actions or some structures that can be put in place. So before we go farther, we wanted to make sure that everyone understands the concept of stoic. So we'll start with the structure for success, and this is your note-taking device. So as we are talking about these, jot down some notes. And the reason it's called a, a good faith experiment is because these are five variables we can experiment with. And we can manipulate in order to create the best classroom possible. You haven't met your kids yet. You don't know exactly who's going to be in your classroom. We don't know what behaviors they are going to display. So what we're going to do is we're going to structure for success knowing it's a good faith experiment. We may have to manipulate some of these pieces um, once we meet our kids. So let's start with structure for success. So we're going to start with structure, but I want you to think about what Renee said for a minute. So because this might be the first time that you've heard this um, for many of you. So when you think about the good faith experiment, experiment makes you think about what? Science, right? Um, so when we think about the word variable, if you're in science, what happens if you change a variable in your experiment? What happens? You change the outcome. And so I invite you to think about these as variables, just like in science or like in algebra, um, any math teachers, pre-algebra, I know middle school folks are in here as well. So if we change that number, that variable, we get a different answer. And so we could actually think about our behavior plan as each one of these are variables. And if you just change one thing, 
then you're going to get a different outcome. So that's why we're going to walk through these one at a time because if something is not going quite right for you and you're not happy with the outcome, you can come back and look at these variables and you don't have to throw the whole baby out with the bathwater. You can just take a look at one of those variables and think about which one of those variables needs to be modified and then you'll get a different outcome and that will help you work towards what you're wanting to have happen. All right, so what are these variables? The first one is an S in stoic, stands for structure for success. And so we'll talk about what does that mean? What is, we hear the word structure. We think about structures in a building. We think maybe about a foundation. So really what it means is being intentional, being strategic, and planning for what we want to have happen. And so when they designed this commons, they planned this structure to support the building. Not after they did the building, but in, before they did, intentionally. So how many of you went to an amusement park or some kind of um, place like that this summer? You may go to a, ride some rides somewhere. Only like, wow, okay. So you all have been to amusement park, right? Okay, <laughs> so um, the most popular rides in the amusement park are usually like the really fast roller coasters and things like that, right? And so have you ever noticed that there's not just like one big long line? Like sometimes at the concession stands, there's like one big long line. You're like, mm, I'm not getting in that line, right? So, but at those really busy popular lines, what, is the, what, is, what happens to that line? What is, how is it structured? Zigzag, right? It's zigzag. So actually somebody realized that people were more likely to get in line and wait because it doesn't look so long if they zigzag the lines. And so um, amusement parks, Disneyland, places like that are very, very highly structured to be very low stress and to, so that you will actually stand in those long lines. Um, so how does that, how do we um, structure our classroom? What does that look like in our classroom? Things that we want to plan and prepare for in advance, proactive, as um, Renee mentioned, are attention signal. So you'll want to write these down. If you haven't thought about what you're going to do, we're going to give you a chance to think about that as well. So Renee said, you know, this is ours. This morning you did it in five seconds. It was amazing. And that is fabulous because there is research that shows how many actually hours are wasted in classrooms waiting to get kids' attention. And so you'll want to have an attention signal. Classroom rules, having those rules set up in advance are really important. You don't want to be reactive, like, oh, that should be a rule. Tomorrow, that's a rule, right? How many of you have your own kids at home? Do you like add rules? Like, oh, no more leaving shoes in the living room. I've had it with this, right? What? The kids are like, wait, that? when did that become a rule? We want to have those rules in advance. We don't want any surprises for our students. The chance and achieve, we're going to talk and learn more about that. Those are our expectations. So we help our students know what to expect. Planning, lesson planning. You know when kids are acting up or talking all the time or laughing and playing around, it might be because they're already done or they're bored or whatever. So you want to be well planned, be very intentional and have solid, strong lesson plans. In those lesson plans, having active engagement activities, and you'll be learning lots about that, but where the students are processing actively with you. Your room arrangement is huge. So you want to be able to move around the room and get to all of the spots in the room. Um, they will find places that you never pay attention to. Uh, and you know, even this commons, the lockers I've noticed over the years, they've changed them because there were probably some places that were, you know, students knew that teachers couldn't see or didn't hang out. And so we structure for success by making sure that our room is arranged the way that we can support our students. Having something called guidelines for success, and you'll learn about that. Your building has guidelines for success. So um, it's really what they believe in in the building, all right? A seating chart is so important. So me thinking about that. And those daily routines. So that structure 
especially really every grade level, we need those routines. And in our primary grades, there's so much research behind how important it is to have those daily routines, those expectations. Because what happens is when they know what to expect and it becomes automatic, it frees up that desk space in their brains so that they're ready to take in new information. If the, if the routine is constantly changing, and then that takes up a lot of brain power to remember or figure out what's going on. And so if we can have those routines in place, then their brains are less cluttered with figuring out all of that, and they're ready to learn. The T stands for teaching our expectations. So teaching and telling, there is a difference, isn't there? And I think about learning to drive a car. I actually went to high school here, took driver's ed here a long time ago. And I, they told us the rules of the road. They told us all of the things we needed to know. But when did I really learn? When I was watching and when I was behind the wheel of a car and doing. So one of the things we need to do is we need to model. We need to model what we're expecting them to do. You are being watched all the time. And kids start, they mirror you. We do it all the time, we don't even realize it. When I taught first grade, um, we used to say the Pledge of Allegiance every morning, and I would stand there and rock this way and say the Pledge of Allegiance. And one day I looked around and my whole entire class was rocking with me because we have something called mirror neurons. And there's research about that. And kids model us. So we wanna make sure we're modeling the behaviors we want our students to model. And that includes in the hallways, talking to our colleagues. Um, the second is role playing. And it might feel silly, but it works. So if you have something that you want your kids to do, a behavior, then we need to not just tell them, but let's practice what does that look like? For me, it was interrupting. You know, I would be talking with another kid, and another kid would come up and be, Mrs. Hopper, Mrs. Hopper, Mrs. Hopper, Mrs. Hopper, Mrs. Hopper. Anyone ever have that happen with your own children? Oh my gosh. So we role played it. And I had a kid come up and act like Mrs. Hopper, Mrs. Hopper, and I'm like, what? And I yelled at them. And then we taught the behavior, the replacement behavior that I wanted. That's the second thing, is we have to teach not only what we don't want, but we need to teach a replacement behavior. And the replacement behavior was then to tap on my shoulder. And I would know, what is that? You could use my shoulder. Oh, she said I could use her shoulder. <laughs> And I would know, and I, you know, and I would tap this fourth grade, tap on their fingers, I know you're there, and when I'm free, I'll turn to talk. So when I have my own children, guess what I taught them? The same thing, so they don't interrupt me when I'm talking to adults. But we had to role play it. If I just would have told them, it probably wouldn't have stuck. That means we have to practice those things. Um, examples and non-examples and examples again. This goes along with that replacement behavior. What does it look like and sound like in our classroom when we're lining up for lunch? What does it sound like when we're coming into our class after passing period? And be very specific. What does it look like and what does it sound like? A great way of doing that is making a class-wide T-chart, right, with those different things. Practice, 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 right? I would say the first three days of school, I wouldn't worry a whole lot about content and curriculum, right? Those of you who have taught before, would you agree with me? Yeah. Set your classroom up for success. Get to know kids. Practice the routines. Practice the procedures. Practice getting up, tucking in your chairs. Practice, practice, practice. And then guess what? You're going to have to do it again about November. And then you're going to have to do it January after Christmas break. And then you're going to have to do it again after spring break. And any other time in between. We want to practice, practice, practice. Again, we talked about the looks like, sounds like chart. That's a nice thing to have up there. And then be explicit. Kids can't read your minds, um, just like you can't read theirs. So we want to be very explicit on what we want and what we expect so that nobody is confused by that. So if I say to you, be respectful, I expect you to be respectful, what does that mean? So we want to be very explicit about what that means. The next 
is the O in stoic, which is observe and monitor. So when we think about it, um, we have a, a partner in our district, Anita Archer. She has famous written books. You can find her on the internet. And she has a saying, um, walk around, look around, talk around. And so what that means is really just getting out and monitoring, um, observing what your students are doing. And so a minute ago, I talked about your, the, the room arrangement. Um, this room arrangement is not great for walking around, looking around, talking around, right? Like right now I'm okay, but I don't know, earlier if you saw me trying to check off people's little yellow cards, I could barely get through. So it's not ideal. So you want to make sure that your room is set up so that you can walk around, look around, talk around, get involved with your students monitoring what's going on um, and interact with them. This is an opportunity for you to gather that formative data. So when you're teaching, and you went over that this morning, we think of that gradual release, I will know if I'm ready to move on to the you do, from the we do to the you do, if my students are ready for it. So if I just move on and I just think, well, well, in my lesson plan, this is where it says I'm supposed to do the you do, but I didn't collect the formative data to let me know that you're ready, then you not, might not learn what I wanted you to learn that day. And so it's an opportunity to gather that formative data on the spot, make sure that your students are, are understanding and performing exactly the way that you were expecting them to be at that point in the lesson. So it's for that reason as well, because we say you can't teach from behind your what? your desk so you will know if your students are with you and and who needs more support or maybe I'm sitting up here and I'm standing up here talking about stoic and you already have written all the examples down all the way through the last variable then I would know that I can move on because you've got this maybe it's a review and your students are already they're ready they're ready to move and you need to move with them so um, be up moving around also, we have the highway patrol analogy, which I love because really, this is the truth. The truth is, what happens when you're driving down the highway and a highway patrolman or a policeman, all of a sudden you look in your rear view mirror and they're behind you. What do you do? You immediately put your foot on the brake, right? It's like automatic, like Whoa. you don't, you could not even be speeding, but it's just automatic. Because when someone is watching, we check ourselves. Right? So same thing when you drive past a policeman. That's what kids know. They know, oh, you know, Miss Young, she's always gonna walk over here and check on them. She never goes over there. I can do whatever I want. So one, you know, if you want to mess around, go to that table, right? Because I'm always up in the front. So you want to trick him. You want to be monitoring. You don't want to be predictable, right? Remember, when someone's watching, we check ourselves and your students will too. So they'll want to be on their best behavior if they know that you're paying attention. The next letter in Stoic is I, interact positively. And this is the biggest bang for your buck. Research has shown that student-teacher relationships impact student achievement by 0.77 effect size, which is huge. That means just by having a positive student-teacher relationship, you're going to add an extra year of academic growth to what kids would already get because of a positive student-teacher relationship. Um, what does that mean? What does that look like? Basically, just real quickly, contingent means you get praise because you did something great. So I might say, Taylor, what a fabulous job you did on using great word choice in your essay, just brilliant. She did something to get that. But I can also give Taylor non-contingent behavior, which means she gets it because she's a human being, because we are breathing the same air. And I might just even come up to her and just go, give her a little wink and walk away. That's non-contingent. It's smiling. It's greeting your students at the door when they walk in. That's a form of a triage. Some of your students are coming from very volatile situations at home, not kinds of homes that we might have grown up in and some of them need that triage. Meeting them at the door, greeting them, saying good morning, checking in, and it's a great way to check to see okay, who's in a great mood, who is maybe needing a little extra support today. Learning their names. You know, elementary, you gotta realize, middle school has got a lot of names to learn, right, middle school? 
and it's going to take a little while, but having structures in place that you can learn student names and, and greeting them by name. Research also shows when people say our name, we perk up. It is, it's, it's awesome to be recognized and be called by name. Be genuine you know, with kids. Don't fake it, especially in middle school, right? They know if somebody's not being genuine, if it's not genuine praise. And then just smile. You know, smile at folks. We talked earlier about mirror neurons. This is a great area here. When people smile, when you smile at kids, people smile back. Um, it's just kind of an automatic reflex. And there's a piggy bank up there. And the reason why the piggy bank is up there is that when we do interact positively, it's like every child has a piggy bank. And we're putting coins into that piggy bank. We're depositing those positive interactions. And I want you to think about yourself as an adult, maybe a boss you had that would be, that gave you lots of, great job, Taylor. All right, Sean, that was awesome. Thank you for doing that, you know. But then one day, something happens and you do something wrong. And it's like you have to take a withdrawal from that. Well, if I already have a lot of money in my bank from you, it's a lot easier to have some taken out because I know you like me and I know it's not personal. Versus if you have a boss that you never get any feedback, you never hear if you're doing good or bad, and then you get that negative, it's a lot harder to take. And that's when we have escalations, that's when we have kids act out, because without that positive interaction, without those deposits in the bank, they're running on empty. So some things to think about. Again, interacting positively, it is the biggest bang for your buck, and it's all about establishing those positive relationships with kids. I'm going to talk next about the C in Stoic, which is correcting calmly, fluently, and consistently. And the truth is, you are going to have to correct. You know, you're going to have to correct the whole class, and you're probably going to have to correct some students one-on-one. -on -one. And so I'm going to jump back for a minute and, and just reiterate that that positive interaction is so important knowing students' names as soon as possible, and building those relationships with that non-contingent attention is key, because you know it's true when they say they don't, they don't care what you know unless they know that you care. That is the truth, and so building those relationships is so important, because at some point, if you do need to correct the student, then we want to correct calmly and fluently, but we also want to be consistent. Um, so let's talk about what this means. Um, they say teachers sometimes have eyes in the back of their head, right? They know what's going on behind them. Um, so we're going to say that you need to correct when you see it, not when you feel it, all right? Um, those of you that have kids at home, I asked that before, right, kids at home, and you like come out and you're like, what's going on out here? And the one sitting there gets in trouble and they're like, it wasn't even me, it was my brothers and they ran out of the room, right? Something like that. So you need to be when you see it and not when you feel it. Also, emotionless. So it's okay to be frustrated with the behavior, but it's not okay to be mad at the child. So remember that you are structuring yourself for success and them for success. So when you correct, it isn't about you and it's not about them, it's about correcting the behavior. So emotionless and being fair. Um, middle school kids especially are all, they will call you out if you are not being fair. So being fair and being consistent. So we don't just come in one day and all of a sudden have new rules. We want to make sure that if we say that that's the rule, that's the rule every day, all the time. Not just you had it and now I'm just throwing this rule in, right? Um, so we'll talk more about having those rules and having those consequences um, and making sure that you have planned for them because you, there's no surprises for students. Uh, it's expect, you're expecting it. You know, if I drive down 21st Street and I get pulled over, well, I'm not gonna be too upset with myself, or I mean with the policeman, because I know he's sitting there and that's what he's doing, and he's watching for people that are speeding. And so um, we need to be consistent. 
So I love this one, state your expectations and walk away. So we call this the hit and run, okay? So here's what the hit and run looks like. So I'll, I'll, is your last name Shear? Uh -huh. Do you know that you're both Howard and Taylor Shear? It's spelled differently. Okay, that was just kind of funny. Cause, yeah. All right, pick it on the front row here. That's, that's what you get right in the front row. So um, Taylor is kind of off task, messing around, right? And so I'm going to come over and go, Taylor, I need you to put that away, and I need you to get back to work, okay? And then I'm going to walk away, right? I'm not going to go, I need you to put that away. <laughs> Because what are they going to do? Now what happens? Wait. Yeah. Ooh, the, we're, we're going to be in a confrontation. right? I tried that on my daughter at home over the breakfast counter to get her to unload the dishwasher. It doesn't ever work. So now I do the hit and run. I need you to unload the dishwasher today. Thank you. Ooh, let me get out of here now. It gets done. If I stand and stare, we're going to flex until we see who's got the biggest muscles. right? So we call that the hit and run. Um, and, and just give them a little space because some kids need to save face in front of their classmates. And so you need to give them that opportunity to save face and then they will follow through. So correct with dignity. Did you notice I was actually had a very nice voice? Have you ever been pulled over and got a speeding ticket and the policeman was super friendly? And he's like, you know, here's how you can even pay less. Donate to the whatever fund and it's a non-moving violation. And have a great day. And you're still sitting there going, oh my god, I just got a ticket. Right? It still stinks no matter how big their smiles are and how nice they are about it. So any correction still stings, you don't have to have a mean voice about it. Right? And then the Q-tip. Quit taking it personal. So they're not doing this just to make you angry all the time, so quit taking it personal. Find your paper that has your teacher that you wrote about at the very beginning of this session, the one that, um, you know, that you just remember as an inspiration to you or someone who impacted your life. And I want you to talk to your shoulder partner about that teacher and what piece of stoic was it that they exhibited? What was the characteristics that were in that stoic? Was it structure? Was it teaching? Was it interacting positively? Was it the observations or the correcting consistently and calmly? Raise your hand if it was the S. S? The O. I skipped the T. The T. The O. The I? Oh, look around. Everybody look around. Is it the I? Raise your hand if it was the I. And if it was the C. Two people, it was the corrections. So, and more than almost the whole room, it was the interact positively. So you can see right there how powerful it is. You know, and I always would, you know, some mornings I wake up or I'm tired, I have a headache, or maybe I took a whole bunch of cold medicine because I really don't feel that great, but it's way more work to get a sub and, you know, then stay home, so I go to work, and then I get in front of the kids, and, you know, there's that saying, fake it till you make it, so you just start smiling, and then those mirror neurons kicked in, and everybody starts smiling back at you, and you start acting positive, and you're interacting positively, and it is so contagious, and you get in the best mood. So even if you're not, and you're feeling like you're having a low morning, just fake it, because it will become real for you real quick. And it's so important. Um, and interacting positively and building those relationships with your students. So now that we've covered STOIC, I would like for you to locate this CHAMPS Classroom Management and Discipline Plan. We call it um, 5.1. This is a document that we are going to work on today. Some of you, you might want to check with your administrators. We have some administrators who really like to have copies of these in the office. Um, that way they can pull it out if they get a call from a parent and they can have that on hand and they can have that as a resource. So you'll want to check and see if that's a requirement from your administrator. Um, some buildings it is and some it's not. But we will be working on that. So 
Um, we're going to fill out specific portions of this today. Um, this is part of the structuring, is having that management plan. So the first thing we're going to look at is rules. So if you look on your management plan, um, you'll see at the top, it has your name and your school year and your room number and your grade level. And then under that it says the structure or the level of structure I anticipate establishing is high, medium, or low. And basically the rule of thumb is um, high structure, um, if you typically have um, more behavior issues in your classroom, medium structure, not as much, low structure, you can pretty much do whatever, everybody's going to be doing great. In Wichita Public Schools in general, every classroom starts out as a high structure classroom, right? And when we say high structure, it doesn't mean we're mean. It's not this whole don't smile till Christmas, right? Actually, it's the opposite of that. We just talked about it. High structure is, is just having things like, like Alicia said, having those things in place so that everything moves smoothly in their classroom. So I would just recommend for everyone, start with that high structure. Guidelines for success. Again, those you will find in your building, so that would be a great question to ask. When you go meet with your administrator tomorrow or next week, what are the guidelines for success in, in this building? But then we have posted rules. Rules should serve as the basis for implementing consequences for the most frequent misbehaviors. So ideally, if students follow the rules, the most likely misbehaviors won't occur. So what you're going to do, it, your table is, uh, with your shoulder partner, I want you to think about and list a few common misbehaviors that drive you crazy, that drive you nuts. You cannot stand it. Um, and we're going to talk about those a little bit more, but write a list of those that may occur this year with your students, and then um, make those the topics of your rules. Okay, so for instance, for me, blurting out, for sure. Some people can handle it, I cannot handle that. So that might be a rule. So do a little brainstorming um, with your shoulder partner. And we're thinking, you know, three to five rules is generally what we want. So think about three to five misbehaviors, the top ones that really just drive you bananas. Share out, what were some of the things you wrote down? I said blurting out, what was something you wrote down? Just popcorn out, don't be shy. Non-compliance. Non-compliance, good, what else? Rocking backwards. Rocking Oh, talking back, okay. What else? Wandering. What was that? Wandering. wandering. Getting up out of their seats and wandering the room. Tattling. Oh, Lord, yes. <laughs> yes. What? what was that? One more time. Food in the oh, food in the classroom. Yeah, that's more of a middle school thing, right? Destructive. My, yeah, destructive. But I would say um, hot Cheetos specifically, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everything's red, the textbook pages are red. So we all have those things. Those are the basis for the rules. One of the, one of the key things about rules is they apply in any situ situation, any time, it doesn't matter. Um, and they can apply whether we're in the classroom learning about math or in social studies or out on the playground. And they are for you. That's why you can't just go buy a list of rules from somewhere else because those may not be the things that drive you nuts. So it really needs to be catered to you. And that's why we start with what are the things that drive you nuts. And guess what? You may add to that list this year, right? And have new rules that need to happen as you get to know your kids. These are a few examples of classroom rules. And if these happen to align with your biggest pet peeves, these are in the Parent Teacher Resource Center. I like that one. It says arrive on time and be prepared to work. Follow directions the first time they are given. That goes along with non-compliance, right? Listen when the teacher or a classmate is talking. Keep hands, feet, and objects to yourself. Stay on task during all work times. Treat everyone with respect, including yourselves. So some of those may fit yours. Others, maybe you need some different ones because your rules, um, you have some other behaviors that you wanna make sure that you're covering. Keep in mind, here's some rules about rules, right? They, we, we want them to be stated positively. So instead of saying, don't be late, we say, be on time. 
It feels different, doesn't it? And so we want to state it positively. And we want them to be specific and observable. And that's why um, the one that said be respectful, then that means that we probably would need to do some teaching maybe about what that means, right? Because it's not super specific. It should be posted in your classroom in a large prominent location um, and visible. And what's nice about that, Alicia is really good about talking about this, but this is you know, my teaching space. I'm teaching and lecturing. It's positive. I can walk over to the rules space, and I can say, Sean, let's just remember this rule. And I can walk away. It leaves it there. It's a third point. It's not coming from me. It's coming from the thing on the wall. And so have them posted prominently where um, kids can see them, where you can see them, and you can refer to them. It has to be, we said this before, applicable throughout the entire class, whether we're doing small group instruction or whole group instruction. And we need to teach them, again, using positive and negative examples. So what does it look like? And what does it not look like? And there's some fun ways you can do that. Um, you can give kids, um, put them in small groups, give them each a rule, especially in middle school, this is fun, and have them teach their class and come up with a visual or a play or a poem or a rap of a non-example and an example. All right, so we're going to take a look at some examples and some non-examples because our rules, as Renee said, should be specific and they should refer to something that is observable. So let's look at these rules. She read through several of these examples, so let's take a minute and look at the non-examples. Always do your best, keep your teacher happy, and be responsible. So turn and talk with your partner for just a minute about why are those rules not going to be rules that we want to put on our, on our posters? So for the first one, you probably said um, it's, it's very broad. Always do your best. So that is an example. Doing your best could be an example of a guideline for success because really it's a goal. All right? And the second one, keep your teacher happy. That sounds awesome to me. But how do you do that? What does that look like? Um, every teacher is different, you come in a different mood, so it doesn't really tell kids what to do. Maybe I like a room that's chatty and kids are talking and working together and the next day I'm like, would you all be quiet, right? So keep your teacher happy isn't really going to work out. And then be responsible, same thing. It is more of a guideline for success. It's, what does it mean to be responsible? Does that mean at a school that has a dress code that you wore your uniform that day? and that it's clean? Or does it mean that you have your homework done? So think about those things, right? They're not that they're bad things. They're just not gonna really be specific observable rules. All right, so what we're gonna do now is take some time to write rules. So on your 5.1 plan where it says posted rules, think about those behaviors. And how would you write a rule for that that is specific, that is positive, can be taught using positive and negative. So three to five rules that could be posted in your classroom. So when we think about things like do your best, and some of you got into the book and saw the guidelines for success and be responsible, remember the rules are rules can be broken and are gonna have a consequence that is assigned to it. So if that kind of you're thinking, well, I thought it was a rule, but maybe it isn't. That can be your gauge is if it's if somebody has broken that rule, that you could give them a consequence, so then that will help you define the difference. So we're moving on from rules to our champs and our ACHIEVE acronyms, and we're also going to share with you another acronym, the MAC. So just to let you know, our early childhood used the acronym MAC. They have three things that they are working on for expectations. Chance is used in elementary schools and um, middle schools. And then we use the acronym ACHIEVE in high school. And so why do we have CHAMPS? You notice that the name of your book is CHAMPS. So this is the work of Randy Sprick. And CHAMPS is all about expectations. One of the things that Renee mentioned was that your rules are consistent. They can hang on the wall and apply in every situation. So we have rules that we follow in society, signs that are posted, and they are, they are for all times. But then we have expectations 
that depend on the circumstance or the situation. So you might not find a rule in this commons area that said voice level zero, because this is also the what? The cafeteria. So during passing period, it might be a hallway and they have certain voice levels, or if it's during class time, then they might not allow any talking in this area. They want it quiet during class time or outside of the classrooms. And then during lunch, obviously, people can talk. So this is where our expectations come in, and this is where our champs come in. So the purpose of champs, and if you would jump in, and this will be a closed read, so Coralie respond with the underlined sections of this passage. Um, the purpose is to define clear and consistent behavioral expectations for all regularly scheduled transitions and instructional activities, such as small group instruction and independent work time. So transitions need to be champed and different instructional situations need to be champed and they may have different expectations. So when we are clear and our students know what we expect, then it's easy for them to follow through. So when we look at champs, we're being proactive in our planning when we think about these concepts. So the C, you'll notice it stands for conversation. So when you're planning your champs, you're going to think about what is it the activity? Is it small group? Is it whole group? Is it a transition? Do I want my students to go from, the, from their desks to the carpet? Do I want them to line up to go to lunch? Do I want them to get ready to go to passing period? What, what's going on? Or maybe um, we're going to go from our individual work time, we're going to go to, they're going to work in partners or in groups. And I have seen kindergartners go from, what do they call the indoor recess time in a kindergarten? They can move and dance and... Yes, they do. That is what they call their brain break. So, but it was way more fun than like just the stretching thing. And I'm telling you what, it wasn't 10 seconds and they were back on their spot on the carpet. So that is a champ transition right there. When kindergartners can go from dancing and moving and music to on their carpet spot and literally in, I think it was 10 seconds. That is, they know their expectation. So how do we do this? We take a look at the acronym. What does it stand for? And we think about these particular questions. So questions to consider for conversation. Can the students talk to each other? So we're not going to have a rule, no talking, right? Because there are going to be times when you want them to talk. That's how we process. That's how we think about things. We talk about it out loud. So it's really important to um, make that phonological imprint in your brain when you talk about something out loud and it sticks. We want our students to do that too. So can they talk? How are they going to get help? Renee shows you how she had her students get help. They didn't go, Miss Hopper, Miss Hopper, Miss Hopper. Um, I've had teachers that they go write their name on the board and they start a list. She doesn't want them just sitting there or standing behind her or raising their hand. So she looks up, she goes and wipes her name off and goes to the next person. So you can think about how do they get help. Lots of teachers want them to ask the person next to them first. And if the person next to them doesn't know, then come ask you. Because sometimes it's just something so simple that someone at nearby person, a nearby student can help with. Activities. So the activity, it could be your content objective. So what are they going to be doing? What's going to be happening in your class that day? So this one can change. So sometimes we see teachers that like to post these. And that's fine, but you have to have a way to change these things because they don't stay all day long. Um, movement. Can they get up and move? What is the expectation? Is this a time where they can get up and get their pencil sharpened and all of that? Because um, I know one of my rules was don't sharpen your pencil while I'm standing up and talking to the whole class. So when, is, when can they do that moving around the room? Participation. How are they going to participate? This is, um, could be that literacy objective. So participation is maybe we're going to be doing some listening and we're going to be doing some small group talking and we're going to be doing some writing. Um, so you're going to make that clear to them how they're going to participate. And then how are they going to know they're successful at the end is the last one. So these are things that you, you would ask yourself as you, as you set up your expectations. And, and often we refer, refer to these as your champs. Um, but they truly are your expectations for what you're expecting during that particular time. 
Now today you've heard us talk about voice level a lot. Within our district, we use voice levels for championing the different conversations. And it's a common language now for our students. For instance, middle school, if I'm going to PE, um, the voice level that of that PE teacher it might be a voice level one is acceptable. And then I might go to another classroom and that teacher, their voice level is two and another teacher it's zero. And so everybody has different expectations. Every teacher has different ideas of what they want in their classroom. And so as kids are transitioning, it's nice to have that common language. And the kids know it. So the story is, I have two little boys. Well, they're not that little anymore. But a couple of years ago, my youngest loves football. Plays for the Grizzlies, not high school, fifth grade. And um, we are involved in the Y. We were doing flag football. And we had a coach out there. He was a college student who was just trying to help. I mean, those kids were out of control, right? I mean, they were crazy. They were running around screaming. And he could not get them to listen to him. And of course, the inner teacher comes out, right? We cannot stand back and just watch it, right? We have to get involved. And so I went up. I'm like, boys, over here. So they all come over, and they're yelling and stuff. I said, voice level zero. And they, it is silence. I'm not kidding you. Like that. And I, when a little boy looks at me, he goes, are you a teacher? <laughs> because guess what? It has become such common language that um, within the city of Wichita, for kids who go to Wichita Public Schools, that their, their churches are using it for Sunday school. You know, it has just become common knowledge. So definitely, if you need a poster, this is a poster, and it's kind of, it's probably more elementary with the pictures, but it's a picture that's available also, a poster at PTR that is available so that you can have that as a reference for your kids. Again, that third point. The other thing about voice level is you want to teach it, model it. I'm often accused in my own house of yelling, and I'm like, I'm not yelling. I'm just loud. Like, I teach, I taught middle school forever, so um, I really don't even need a microphone. So that might be your student as well. It is also it, my daughter so, um, and my son. So they need specific direction on what that sounds like. I've also, I know that teachers say, you know, it's voice level two. Well, voice level two is all of a sudden voice level four. And then, you know, they think they're still at voice level two. So what does it sound like? You need to like, okay, everybody ready, go, voice level two. Everybody's listening. Now, voice level four, what does that sound like? So make sure if you're, if it's not working for you, step back and say, you know, what can I do to change? What do I need to reteach? What do I need to model for them? And then you'll get the result that you want. So when we think about champs, um, we also want to have those displayed. And these are just some examples. You will find them in the bathrooms. You will find them in the hallways. And we want them in our classrooms as well. And as a teacher, it's beautiful because um, I used CHAMPS when I was in the classroom and was able to say, we're now in direct instruction. All your eyes are on me. There's nothing in your hands. You're actively listening. And then if someone had something in their hands, instead of coming up to them and saying, Ben, put that away, I would say, everyone remember what our CHAMPS are for direct instruction? There's nothing in our hands. Just a reminder. There's no escalation. There's no embarrassment of a student that way. Um, and so we want to have them posted. And, and they work beautifully. I mean, I just champed a sleepover last Friday. And literally, it's time for bed. Conversation is a zero. Help, there is no help. Go to bed. The activity is sleeping. Movement, none. Participation, all y'all. Success, I'm not cranky. And I really literally did that. And they went to bed, so that was good. <laughs> We do use these at home, and I have to tell you that with Stoic, when I come to work and complain about my high schoolers, Gina, who taught you all the instruction this morning, I can see her and she's looking at me and she's smiling and I know what she's thinking. And you know what she's thinking? You're perfectly structured to get the result you're getting. It's like Stoic. So it's my fault that it's not working. So remember that we have so much influence on the results that we get and sometimes we forget how much influence we have and that we just need to step back and we need to take a look at what we want to change how we need to change it to make it work for us um, because then no one's cranky right so when we think about what needs to be champed when do we need to tell our students specifically those expectations here are lots of ideas and things that you would want to champ so you can look at these, jot these down, take a picture of it if you want. Um, and then Renee is going to throw up 
the, an outline to show you that there's some we really want you to start with. Because obviously, this is going to take some work, especially if you like to make them look cute. Um, but remember, you, you need to have them be so they're, they're not just um, something that's static that just stays all the time. You want to be able to use them. I even saw a teacher that would have students. That was somebody's helper job to go change it. That they got to know them so well that they knew and they had little magnets and they just changed it real quick. Take a look. Um, these might be some that you start with. That direct teacher instruction, um, independent work time, and cooperative group work time. Um, as well as you might think about what are those big transition times. Uh, and those would be the ones that I would start with as far as creating the champs. So what you're going to do is think about what activities and tr transitions might you need to, to write for your champs. Um, I had four. That's it. And that's all I really needed. Um, direct instruction, small group work, independent work, and quizzes. Those were what I needed for my fourth graders. Um, if you teach kindergarten and first, you might need some very different ones, right? It might be carpet time. It might be something like that. So you need to think about what it is that you are achieving. You know, if you teach science or any kind of a technical type of a, a class, you might need one for lab, right? So think about your content area and what you might need. And again, as the year goes on, you might find, okay, I need another chance for this activity. Um, so using this document, if you'll find this yellow document, by the way, this, the front of this is in poster size at the PTR as well. So if you wanted to go get posters and make them that way. On the inside are some examples of um, how they have worked through. Um, and then on the very back are the questions to ask yourself about what are your expectations for kids. Keep in mind that you need to be thorough and that um, the more detailed you are, the more explicit, the more clearly you'll be able to communicate your expectations to students and the more consistent you are likely to be in implementing your expectations. All right, let's take a look and read this together. Again, jump in. This is a closed read, so jump in on the green underlined words. And let's review the rules and expectations. Because rules and expectations communicate different information that is necessary for our students to operate successfully in our classrooms, both have benefits to being posted in our classrooms for student and adult reference. So that adult reference, that really helps if you have extra folks, extra support in your room, especially if they go from room to room when you have substitute teachers. Um, we once had one of our colleagues have to step in and take over. I think it was a first grade classroom. And, um, and it was a really funny story because she was trying to get their attention and it was kind of like Renee was describing on the football field and they were not listening, not listening, not listening. And so then the, I think it was a pair came in and immediately did the attention signal and they all responded immediately and she was like, oh, why didn't anybody tell me what the attention signal was? And so Renee gave me a click. So take your pencil out and write these down and if you want to be a superstar, post this somewhere. So just in case you have a substitute or somebody have to step in um, to your classroom, they'll know those first graders, man, they knew their attention signal, but everything else that our colleague was trying was not working. People might say, listening, and everybody listens, right? So that's one. Everyone's eyes on me, and you can do let's begin. Some people clap. Also, the may I have your attention, please? That works great, especially in large groups. We always say you want everyone to raise their hand because sometimes the people that are turned the other way, they don't see the presenter or the teacher. And so then when they, the direction they're looking, folks have their hands in the air, they know. Also, if you can hear my voice clap once, clap. If you can hear my voice clap twice, I've heard class, class, and then the class responds, yes, yes. Um, also, kind of a little cheerleader, I've heard this before, and we'll just use Northwest since we're here, and their mascot is the Grizzlies, right? So I might say Northwest Grizzlies, Grizzlies or you, and clapping along with it, do it, can you do it? Just do. Northwest Grizzlies, Grizzlies. 
And so then everybody has their attention. So uh, I've seen a lot of elementary schools do that with their mascot. That is kind of, sometimes schools have universal attention signals or they like to do those. They do them at the lunchroom or assemblies and things like that so you can find out. But um, think about what maybe you used when you were a student teaching or when you have taught before and what works for you because that's what you want to use, what works for you. Um, and, and make it your own. But the most important thing is this, that you choose one and you use it and you're consistent with it. And if the kids aren't doing it right, then guess what you need to do? Teach it. You need to teach it, practice, model it, practice, model, practice, until they're doing it to the expectation that you expect. Because so much time is lost in just waiting. If you wait, you're gonna wait all day. So they have, they, five seconds should be your rule that it takes to get their attention. The other thing we want you to look for is encouragement procedures. These are still are called class-wide motivators. Here are some quick examples from classrooms. This is all cloud elementary. But we do want to talk about intermittent celebrations. So if your students have many risk factors and need a highly structured management plan, it will probably be essential for you to use intermittent rewards regularly along with non-contingent attention and positive feedback. So part of that interacting positively is also having that kind of motivation, class-wide motivation system. And we, we gave you some intermittent celebrations. So if you'll find this Manila page, some ideas for ways that you can celebrate. And, and we all love celebrations. There's some ideas there for younger kids and, and then there's some for older and then for the group. So um, a lot of these are things that don't cost money, which is great. Um, and you know, your kids, your students may also have some ideas of what they would like for celebrations. So that is there as a resource for you. And in your books, yes. In your CHAMPS book, and your DSC book, um, under the chapter, there's a chapter for classified motivation, and there's a lot of things in there as well. Um, and be sure to talk to your coach, your academic coach, um, who's at your building if you need more assistance with that, or Alicia and I are happy to help. Also, again, look for these tomorrow. Those of you going to model classrooms, look for those. If you are not, look for those in your building. But Randy Sprick, the author of your book, says teachers can help every student exhibit behaviors that will make that student feel like a champion. And you all wrote down earlier today about a teacher that impacted you. And now you um, are having that same opportunity to go impact students in your classrooms. Um, and so we just hope that we see this app applied. And if you do have any questions, myself, Alicia, Gina, any of us would be very, very happy to come and support you, as well as your building coach.